For this reason, I go to quite a number of places. But this morning, the adoration and worship to the Father was wonderful. And you wouldn't believe it how many places I go to sing songs about themselves. Sing songs about their own situation. Sometimes mentions Jesus. But this morning, we were pouring out to the Father. And this is so great because this is a word that God has put on my heart for you guys, particularly in the context of this country going through unprecedented shaking. I've never known a time politically, economically, socially that our country is creaking. And therefore our eyes are to be on the Lord. The Christ community, the community that's born of the Father, are to be a perfected demonstration of what is it like to live in security in times of shaking and troublesome times. And this morning I want to talk about knowing the Father. You think, well Ian, I thought I knew the Father. Well, so did I. I was in ministry for over 20 years, pastoring the church, pastoring God's people, until one day God said to me, Ian, I want you to take a sabbatical. And I thought, I don't even know what one of those is. Because my Pentecostal tradition meant I had the Holy Spirit, I could keep going forever. And the Lord said, I want you to take a sabbatical. It's not just for Anglicans and it's not just for Catholics. It's for you to take time out and become refreshed and reorientated. And so I took this sabbatical not knowing what it meant. And what the Lord did is that he encountered me as a father in a fresh new way. Revealing himself and revealing myself to me. And I didn't know that I was motivated by a whole load of performance. Things I was doing was because I was wanting to perform. It had become a way of life that I was unaware I had. Performance orientation ultimately wears you out. And God was wanting me to live in intimacy with him and to live in peace with him so that I could produce fruit for him because I was living his life, not mine. What's stunning to me is that um, having moved 18 months ago to Scarborough on the East Coast, every place I live I want to discover the spiritual history because I'm a newbie, and there's been things that have been going on before me. I want to line up with what God is doing. Spiritual history in Scarborough is amazing. I haven't got time to go through it today. I just want to mention one thing. I discovered that Scarborough was the town where Derek Prince got saved. You think, Derek Prince. Anybody remember, know of Derek Prince? Okay, some of you. Okay, Derek Prince was a... A uh, brilliant Bible teacher. He, he's an English guy, spent a lot of the time elsewhere but England. But such brilliant teaching. And I was affected as a young man by his teaching. He did so much in his life, but at the age of 80 plus, this is his testimony, he experienced God as his father that changed his life. After all that he had written, after all that he had preached, he experienced God as his father at 80 plus years of age. And my personal experience is I've, I found Derek rather austere and rather uh, his, his army background of all of the male people in his army being army 
personnel captains and commanders, etc., etc. He, he was very disciplined and, as I say, sometimes austere. After encountering the father, he could hardly speak a sentence without tearing up. He was so moved that he was loved, accepted. The things we've been singing and sharing to the Lord today, these are the things that Derek experienced as 80 plus. What I'm discovering is that however much we know the Father, because he is so huge, because he is out without limits, there's always more of the Father to know and experience. And Derek did series on what it means to know the Father. And all of this was before he actually had an encounter that changed him forever. In times of uncertainty, God is looking for a people whose hearts are devoted to him. He's wanting us to experience him afresh all over again. There's always more to come into. So I don't want to base what I'm saying today on my experience or Derek's experience, but I want us to come into the word of God to hear what the word says about experiencing the Father. So if you would turn with me, please, to John chapter 17. It's not that my experience isn't valid, but do you know what? God is such a loving, creative Father. He has a different kind of relationship with each of his kids. And he doesn't want you to have my experience. There's one that is tailor-made for you. I, I love the fact that uh, four kids, eight grandkids, have a different relationship with everyone. Why? Because each of them has a different personality and they bring out something in me toward them and the dynamic and interaction that I have with each of my kids and grandkids is unique and different. God made you in his image and likeness. You are unique. He doesn't want to duplicate the relationship with somebody else that he has with you. He wants something that's unique toward you. He loves you so much, there's no one else that's like you. So that's why I want to base it in scripture rather than experience. John chapter 17, verse 3. Oh, let's pick it up at verse 1, get the context. Jesus spoke these things, and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Eternal life comes through knowing. That isn't intellectual knowing, that is experiential knowing. Knowing God the Father and who his precious Son is, Jesus Christ. Eternal life comes through relationship, experience of the Father and the Son. And because they are without limit, this relationship that we have with them is without limit so that there's always more of abundant life, eternal life that he wants to pour into our hearts. Let's go back to Matthew's gospel. I want to read another scripture from there. Jesus is speaking. This is again a stunning statement. Matthew 11 verse 27. is what Jesus says. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son 
except the Father. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Staggering statement, only the Son knows the Father. Because of the intimacy from eternity past, the Son knows the Father in a unique way. And he, Jesus, wants to reveal the Father to whomever he will. And so connecting with Jesus is a means to which we not only know him, but he introduces us to the Father. And so Jesus says in the upper room, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Derek Prince points out of this verse two things that stand out to him. One, Jesus is the way, and two, the Father is the destination. He makes this outstanding statement, most believers are on the way, but few have made the destination. The destination is the Father, a relationship of love, a relationship that establishes us in our true nature of who we are to be as sons, both men and women, sons, receivers of the spiritual inheritance of our Heavenly Father. So I want to just briefly give you three hallmarks of what I've come to realize are things that make clear that we've experienced the Father. I want you to know I'm still on the journey. For me, there is even more. I'm grateful for what I've received, but I don't want myself or anyone in this room this morning to be content where we are when there's yet so much for us to come into, especially in the context of our world right now that's being shaken, that we want to be connected to the unshakable one, the Father who does not change. There is no shift in shadow in him that we can represent the Father into our world that's increasingly running out of options for where they can find security. It's always going to be in the the Father. You are honored. You are chosen to live in the Father and to represent him in this time and in this season. This, to me, is a great honor for you. This is a key word for you in Chester and Cheshire. You are people that he's raising up in shaking times to represent the unshakable person and his unchanging kingdom. So here are the three hallmarks of knowing the Father and also knowing the Son. First thing is it gives a sense of personal identity that is unshakable. It's what happened to Jesus who was baptized in the Jordan, came out of the river, and the heavens opened and the Father said, this is my beloved Son. In him I am well pleased. His identity is affirmed as a Son who is loved. But it's not about me telling you that, it's what is the Father telling you? What is coming out of the Father's mouth? that gives you that security. I'm very grateful to church leaders. I'm very grateful to people who have been influences in my life. But ultimately, it's not what comes out of their mouth. It's what comes out of the Father's mouth that brings security. Sense of identity. Of course, if you remember, 
Jesus hear the, hears these words. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And the spirit immediately takes him into the wilderness. And the very first thing the enemy says to him in the temptation in the, in the, in the wilderness is, if you are the son of God, turn these stones into bread. Beloved, the enemy is an identity thief. He seeks to take away what God is saying. He seeks to sow seeds of doubt in your heart about what the Father says about you. And right now, our society is being ravaged by identity theft and by false identity that the enemy wants to put the way of our society. And it requires the community of Christ to stand up in true identity as sons of the Most High to declare what the identity is that the Father is saying, not only to us, because when I know my own identity, I can speak identity to people who are wavering because they don't know who they are, because they too are made in the image and likeness of God, and I can declare that to them and draw that out of them only if I know my true identity. Beloved, this is your calling, to stand in your identity, that you can help to be an identity giver to those that are wavering in our society. Jesus goes on to say to the enemy who questions his identity. Man doesn't live by bread alone. But every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God the Father. What God is saying to you, what the Father is speaking to you, right now is the most precious thing you could ever receive. He never has throwaway words. He never has casual conversations. His words are spirit and life. And what he says to you and what he says about you are the most important words you will ever hear. It's time for God's people to stand in their true identity. Second thing that knowing the Father gives us is a deep sense of security. I know who I am because he says so. And I can be secure in who he has made me and called me to be. I want to give you a scripture, which is John chapter 10 and verse 27. This is the truth of the security that he gives us. John 10, 27. Again, it's Jesus is speaking. My sheep hear my voice. And I know them, and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Security is that we are in the heart and hand of Jesus and the Father, and no one can change our status and our position, no one can snatch me out of my Father's hand. That is security. Now, whatever the enemy seeks to do, because the Father has committed to protect me, I cannot be taken by the enemy's plans because I'm secure in the hand and heart of the Father. And so in these days, we again turn our hearts to know the Father, to hear his word, to be affirmed in our heart and in our security. And the brilliant thing about knowing who we are and being secure 
is that it delivers us from being competitive. I don't have to compete with you. Because you have gifts that I don't have. But if I know who I am, I can celebrate who you are. And in celebrating who you are, it releases a culture of honour amongst us that we cheer one another on and we don't strive and we don't compete because I'm secure in who I am and I'm secure in who you are and I want you to be the best person that you can possibly be and I will cheer you on, I will not compete with you. The church is to be a family that celebrate, that honour one another, where a culture of honour is so formed that people go, I want to be a part of what they're drinking, what they're feeding on, what they're receiving. I want to be a part of this. And in these days of insecurity, culture of honour is to arise in and through God's people that's going to represent a different flavour and a different culture. All right, here's the third thing that I believe is a hallmark of true sonship. And that is purity of motivation. Jesus says, I only do the things that please the Father. He only did those things that pleased the Father. When we receive agape love, and, and none of us are born with it, we all receive it. We love agape because he first agaped us. So it's a divine love. It's it's unconditional it's just so resourceful and amazing and so we we receive agape from one source that is from above from God himself and having received agape Jesus says as you've received agape one another and so I give to you what I have received I didn't have it first of all I received it now that I've received it I can give it When you receive agape, it's so pure, it has no agenda in it at all. Agape never seeks its own, it always seeks the benefit of the other person. And once you receive agape, it's so beautiful, it is so pure, you always want to please the one that you receive agape from. And having received agape, it purifies our heart so that our motivation is to please the one who poured in the agape. This is Jesus. He only did what he saw the Father do. God is purifying our hearts by his agape. So that we're doing the things that please him. So these hallmarks of identity, of security, of purity of motivation establish our hearts in days of shaking. This is my conviction. In his grace, God has a deep love for this nation. I don't understand it, but I know he's a deep love for the nation. I know he has a deep love for the continent too. That's why we travel there. That's why we minister into there because he wants his European bride back. But there is something about this nation, and I don't understand it, but in the economy of God, he has used this nation to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. 
And here's the thing, this nation along the way has lost its way, not realizing that it was meant to carry the word of God to the ends of the earth still. The calling hasn't changed. And in the midst of other agendas that have arisen, this nation has lost its way, but God is so jealous for this nation that he's not averse to shaking it, to bring it back to its divine destiny and purpose. And as society shakes, God is wanting his righteous ones, his oaks of righteousness, to stand. And it's not that we may not be affected by it, but we won't be greatly shaken because he is our source and our devotion and love to him will be a signpost for people to say, I want to tap into why they're not shaking when everything around is moving. Darkness may cover the earth and gross darkness the people, but the Lord arises upon you and his glory is to be seen on you as you receive from the Father and as you become even more established in your identity, in your security, and in the pure of, purity of your heart motivation to please him. So the message I have for you today is there is an experience with the Father that is available to each person. And even though you may have received there is a fresh experience of the Father in our day that will affirm and secure our lives. This is how it is. This is how it always is. Jesus says no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he becomes like a little child. It's not to be sophisticated. It's not to be intellectual about it. I'm, I'm not, not anti-intellectual. I wouldn't have done what I did in my studies if I was. I'm not anti-intellectual, but primarily we're not to be led by our brain. We're to be led by our spirit. God is looking for childlike simplicity. And eager heart response to him to say, I want to experience you afresh in these days. I don't want a testimony from 10 years ago or 20 years ago. I want a testimony of you right now, Heavenly Father, so that I can represent you into a world that is shaken. Let's just stand a moment, if you wouldn't mind, just in his presence.